go ahead and start since it's one o'clock. This is Dr. Natasha Holmes. She's from Cornell University. She's an assistant professor there. Um, in Canada, and I can't pronounce all these things right, but her undergrad was in Colt, Colt, Colt. Okay, and grad at UBC, which is the University of British Columbia. And then she came down to the States and was in Stanford as a postdoc uh, for a couple of years, with Carl, working with Carl Wyman, who's a famous Nobel Prize winning physicist, for you who are not physicists. And now she's an assistant professor at Cornell. And with that, I'm going to let her begin. Great. Okay. Um, so thank you all for coming. It's really great to have you here. And I um, hope we can have some nice dialogue. Please feel free to um, pause me at any time and uh, we can chat. So um, I'm going to be talking about uh, why traditional labs fail and what we can do about it. Uh, I am a physicist, so most of my examples will come from physics. But I think a lot of what I have to say is sort of general, certainly across STEM. Um, so hopefully we can have some nice dialogue about that. Um, so I've been at Cornell about two years now. We're starting up a interdisciplinary uh, education, science education research group, um, spanning, expanding into biology. And then um, so a number of my grad students and postdocs and um, collaborators um, who have been contributing to this work in a variety of ways. And I'll sort of give them shout outs throughout the process, of course. OK, so we're going to um, start with a little bit of an activity. Uh, this room is nice and cozy, so I'm going to get people to shout out. Finish this sentence for me. My introductory labs were Boring. Boring. <laughs> Keep them going. <laughs> I got boring. Are the loud ones I've heard? I can't I have to say exciting. Exciting. Boring. Good. Cool. cool. Chaotic. Chaotic. Other stuff. Pointless. Pointless. <laughs> <laughs> smelly. What? <laughs> Chemistry. Chemistry. Okay, right. Smelly. Yeah. Other stuff? Can. Can. Cool. Cookbooks. Yeah. Cool. Um, so it's great to hear the variety of things in here. As we know, there are, I think, some things that are, we've seen both ends of the spectrum, um, just from what people have shouted out. Labs are not inherently bad, but often the implementation is less than what we want. Um, I had some fun. I've been exploring social media, so I asked this of my Twitter followers and their responses I put into a word cloud. Um, and this is what they told me. <laughs> So the sort of idea of um, you know sort of pointless, uh, forgettable really was the word that jumped out for a lot of people, um, which to me sort of reeks of I wasn't actually learning anything, um, and we'll sort of dig into to what that means. Um, yeah. So oh, and then this is the other side of things. So I um, uh, gave a written survey to students about you know asking them a bunch of questions about experimental physics, and on the last question, this was one of the handwritten responses from a, stu a physics student. Um, and this idea of, I hate labs, theory only. So what I want to talk about are sort of first these two competing ideas, this one that, that labs, what happens in labs is sort of forgettable and we might not actually be learning anything. And then the other side that we have these very passionate, emotional responses to labs that I want to kind of disentangle a bit. Um, and for me as a physicist, this other piece, theoretical only, um, is, is an interesting piece, this idea that um, we've actually heard in interviews students say things like, they want to be theorists rather than experimentalists because of their intro labs, which seems like a uh, something that we need to think about. Um, so when I talk about traditional labs, I'm referring to things with two very specific features. Um, right again, I'm not talking about all labs, but labs that are highly structured and where the aim is to confirm a particular outcome, to verify, reinforce the content from class, and students will follow this sort of canned set of instructions in order to confirm a particular outcome. So that's a very specific, I want to sort of put the constraints on it here, that that's the kind of lab that I talk about when I'm talking about traditional labs. Um, and we'll sort of dig into what the issues are with those. Um, so what I want to go through is, first of all, just does research actually support these anecdotes that students aren't really learning anything um, and that they have these very emotional responses? Um, can we explain why these issues exist? And then what do we do about it? And then with whatever time I have left at the end, some data that shows that what I think is the ways to do about it actually works basically all of the data. Okay, so um, the first piece I want to dig into is um, this notion of students aren't learning anything in the labs. So we asked the question, does taking a lab that's designed to reinforce course material actually improve student understanding of the course material? So in these traditional labs where the goal is to reinforce and confirm the, the content from lecture, does that actually help student learning? 
Um, and this can be hard to disentangle from other elements of the course, but we were fortunate to find a couple of institutions where the lab course was optional. And so we could directly compare students who were enrolled in the lab with students who were not in the enrolled in the lab. And then we compared their learning on the final exam because the goal of the labs was to reinforce the course material. Okay, see a couple of faces, some eyes are getting a little bit questionable. Hold on, <coughs> if you've got an optional lab, you have direct um, selection effects we need to deal with because students who opt to take the lab are not gonna be the same as the students who opt not to take the lab. This is literally a selection bias um, in our sample that we have to sort of deal with. So the way that we deal with this um, is identifying that on, in any, at least in our intro physics courses, there's a ton of content and maybe you know 10 to 15 lab activities related to that content. So not all material on the final exam has an associated lab. So what we can do then is take students' score on questions where there was a lab to reinforce it, divided by their score on questions where there wasn't an associated lab, um, and then make comparisons of that ratio. So because all content was covered somewhere, just some of it was further reinforced in the labs, the hypothesis that we're testing is that this ratio should be bigger for the students who take the lab than for the students who don't take the lab. And that sort of division um, is what we're doing to sort of normalize with some of these sorts of selection effects. See nods, people are with me? Okay. Um, so we've done this now at uh, three different institutions. Um, some key differences between these institutions. We had different populations of students, varied instructional approaches, a combination of mechanics and electricity and magnetism courses, different instructors, but they all shared the goal that the labs were designed to reinforce the content from lecture. Um, they were designed to achieve that aim, so students would be asked a lot of reflection questions, you know, make a prediction about what you expect to see, um, then do the experiment, compare your results to the predictions, explain what's going on, things like that. Um, but it was generally quite prescribed, so this can sort of set of procedures to follow in all three cases. Okay. Okay. So what I'm going to show you here is a graph with, um, on the y-axis there, is going to be the ratio for, for the groups. We've got three different courses at three different institutions along the bottom. And then we'll have the students who took the lab will be in blue, the students who didn't take the lab will be in orange. Okay. So, low tech quicker, quicker question. We're going to use our fingers, one, two, three, or four. Uh, so what is your prediction about what the data is going to show? One is that um, the students who take the lab will do better than the students who don't take the lab, so blue will sit above the orange dots. Two is that uh, maybe the lab will actually hurt students' understanding, so they'll do worse. Three is no difference, or four, there's going to be some pattern in the results between the different courses that we'll have to make sense of. So students on, who take lab. Pardon? I'm thinking if there is any overlap between the lab and the practicals, the theory they are taking, then definitely the lab category will gain. But if there is no overlap and it's just the lecture based, then obviously. All of the material is covered in the lecture. So all of the students have the lecture material, mm -hmm. but some students also have it in lab. So it's reinforced, the same content is reinforced in the lab. Oh, okay, the lab. Yeah. Okay, on three, one, two, three. Got a lot of threes, a bunch of ones, a bunch of fours, no twos, interesting. Okay. Um, looks like a little bit of everything, so let's take a look and see what uh, happens. Ready? So within within the error bars, there is no difference between this ratio across the board. And in some cases it might be higher, in some cases lower, but certainly within uncertainties it's no difference. People are sort of like looking complacent or something. <laughs> Surprised, confused, concerned. I mean, it's reasonable. If you think about labs as a reinforcement of their understanding, right? It has no new knowledge into it or like a practice into it. That's why, and also the traditional tests test their, you know, not only about their memorization, rather than their understanding of the knowledge. Fair so enough. that's why I predict this almost the same. Yeah, okay. So sort of some uh, imbalance on just what the labs are teaching versus what they're testing. Um, and what was the other piece was, uh, it's already sort of covered, right? Yeah, this extra time yeah. on task should really make a difference. Yeah. And 
and its application. I think that's another piece that we'll come back to in a little while. Um, the other thing I should mention, um, we also actually sliced this. We, we took the exams and pulled, teased apart just questions that tested conceptual understanding and questions that were sort of mathematical problem solving. And even if we just looked at each of those pieces, the same we got the same results across the board, which was uh, kind of nuts. Yeah. Were these three response questions? Were they multiple choice? Were they a combination? Is it possible that the quality of instruction and the nature of the non-lab instruction could have been much better in the institution which didn't have a lab? In other words, if neither place had a lab, it is possible that one of the institutions could be way better anyway. So this was a, in these situations, um, the individual class had an optional lab. So the population of students, each, each pair of dots were all in the same lecture with the same instructor. Okay, so we'll do one more and then we'll move on. So it's relevant to that, sense. but I was thinking since the lab is optional, so do you really think that the lecture course would be satisfactory, I guess, to for the students to understand everything? So that, that would mean that even if you have a lab, you already understood well in the lecture. So there was no point to lab? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so well, no, I don't think that's, <laughs> But I don't think that's right. It just means it doesn't reinforce the lecture material. That doesn't mean there's no point to it. So oh, the, the, other materials. Yeah. Yeah. the conclusion that we're playing with um, to hedge appropriately is that the labs are not providing measurable added value to learning the course content beyond what's being done in the lectures and, and discussions. So this one not physics majors, right? Pardon? This one not physics majors. A combination. We had some physics majors, some algebra-based classes, a little bit of everything across the groups. Um, and I want to just reinforce so this comment of, uh, may, it's not that they weren't learning anything, they may have been learning something else, but I want to remind you that the sole purpose of these labs was to reinforce student understanding of that content. And so I think what we're bringing in up is that we need to think about that goal um, when it comes to our labs. Um, the other uh, piece of this that we were talking about is this idea of students' attitudes um, towards the labs, their attitudes towards experimental physics, all of these things. Um, this one. <laughs> so we want to, um, I want to pull that one apart a little bit as well. And for this, um, I'm drawing on work by folks at the University of Colorado Boulder, um, who have a survey called the E-Class, the Colorado Learning Attitudes About Science Survey for Experimental Physics, um, which is a sort of a series of statements that they give students about experimental physics, and they ask students the degree to which they agree or disagree with the statements. So for example, um, one of the statements is, when doing an experiment, I try to understand how the experimental setup works. So an expert would agree with that statement. So you want to look at whether the students align with the experts. They also agree. Or when doing a physics experiment, I don't think much about source of systematic error, which an expert would disagree with. And so you look at how many of the students disagree with that statement. There's also things like, I believe that if I work hard, I can succeed at physics, or I enjoy working with my hands. There's sort of a whole bunch of um, layers of questions embedded on this survey. Um, and so they had given this, this survey to um, thousands of students across the country, across Canada, a bunch of different places. Um, and uh, they give the survey at the beginning and end of the course, and then you look at how their attitudes sort of change by the end of the semester. Um, and so I've got, we've got the shift here, so a positive shift would mean that their answers at the end are more expert-like than when they started, so that's a, a good direction. Negative is they've become less expert-like by the end of the course. Um, and when they gave this survey out, they asked the instructors who were giving it to their students to sort of break down the structure of their course. Is it, um, is their lab course intended to reinforce concepts? Is it intended to teach experimentation skills? Or is it trying to do both? Um, and then they sort of analyze the data separately by looking at those groups of students. Um, so another set of quick predictions. So one is that by the end of the course, all students are more expert-like no matter what the structure of the course is. Two is all students are less expert-like no matter what the structure of the course is. Uh, three, as long as you're teaching concepts, students' attitudes are gonna become more expert-like. Four is as long as you're teaching skills, um, their attitudes will become more expert-like. Or five, there will be no difference across the board. We can't do anything to change student attitudes. <laughs> okay, on three, one, two, three. Okay, we've got threes, fours, five seems to be the most popular, but we've got kind of a little bit of everything. So let's take a look. 
Um, and they even split this one out, so FY is first year courses and BFY is beyond first year courses. So they tried to tease apart, maybe there was something up with the physics majors in upper division. Um, and so it looks like across the board, sort of if you are trying to teach concepts, you either have no change or a huge decrease in student attitudes. Um, but trying to teach skills uh, has some benefits, which is obviously where we'll be going in the rest of my talk. Okay. Um, oh, and then I uh, want to also mention that they similarly asked the instructors if their class was uh, very structured and guided, or if there was any amount of open-endedness in the class. Um, and basically the same sort of thing showed up, that any amount of open-endedness looks like the skills um, creates these sort of positive shifts, but these very canned, overly structured things cause these um, declines. And I'm not sure, I think there's a big correlation between uh, concept-focused and guided, but that's <coughs> another question for another day. Yeah? How much do you think students' attitudes uh, are engaged or involved in this? I mean, if they actually hate Labs, they're much less likely to you know, have a positive learning outcome. Um, yeah, it's it's hard to disentangle. I think that there's definitely a lot of overlap. The reason uh, I'm between. asking, I don't teach physics, I teach chemistry, but mm -hmm. we're seeing the same sorts of things that when you talk to the students, their antipathy toward the course is really doesn't influence what they remember on day Yeah, and I and, and I think you know, I think their motivation, you know, research on student motivation and attitudes, you know, the, the effort that they put in is going to get entangled with that, the quality of the conversations that they have with other people, you know, whether they will ask for help, like there's a ton of stuff that gets sort of wrapped up in their, their attitudes and motivation, um, let alone just the actual cognitive things of if all they're thinking about is how much I hate this, there's not a lot of cognitive space <coughs> for actual learning. So yeah, there's a lot, a lot of this or entangled pieces. So, yeah. so was this done with controls across a broad range of institutions or? Yeah, this is like, I think that it's something at least 6,000 students, if not more in this but there, And there's some where it's the same institution and some people focus on concept and some on skills? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, but there's you know, enough institutions that it's sort of fair to, to drop them, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a question too early, but I want to know what are the skills you are teaching them or like how are the skills to taught? Like, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get there, okay. yeah. yeah. In this case, it's so many students and so many different groups that it's, there's no, nothing really, I can't really say anything. Um, okay, so I'm gonna put a check mark here that at least there's research that sort of supports these anecdotes that students may not actually be learning the content that we're trying to teach them, um, and that their attitudes are you know, problematic um, in these labs. And so figuring out now uh, what is it that's actually going on uh, is what I wanna talk about next. Um, so I, I put up this figure that these tra traditional labs are highly structured and aiming to confirm something. And what I'm sort of arguing is that it's the combination, I think either of these on their own might be fine, but the combination of them becomes particularly problematic, so which is why I'm allow allowing myself to actually use a Venn diagram. Um, and the reasons are that in this um, overlap, there's this entanglement of what I call, um, my, what I'm, three A's at this point, uh, agency, authority, and authenticity. And we'll sort of talk about each of those. Um, so the first one is student agency. So uh, there's a lot of disagreement on what agency is. So my working definition is that an agent is someone who is making decisions to pursue a goal. Um, and so, uh, I'm missing a slide, but uh, the idea of agency, there's work going back to the 80s in psychology that sort of says that if you give students agency, it improves their self-efficacy. Um, in general, it improves learning, motivation, persistence in STEM, retention of underrepresented minority students, you know, all kinds of wonderful, wonderful benefits um, for giving students agency some sort of control over the decision-making process um, for, in their classes. Um, so this is a, so to, to, in a, in a lab, you can imagine that agency is giving students the sort of decision-making space to actually decide how to conduct the experiment. So on the next slide, I have a ton of words that I will sort of bold and talk about. You do not have to read it. Um, this was taken directly from one section of a capacitor's lab at an institution. I don't even remember which institution it is anymore, but I promise it is real. Um, so these are the instructions. So, and when we think about agency, right, are students in control? Are they making the decisions to pursue their goal? So just to bold some of the words, they're given instructions like connect, use this, select the thing, this should be connected here, this other thing should be connected here, connect these things, uh, use the mouse to hit the collect button, like 
there is no available decision making. The instructor has basically made all of the decisions for the student in this lab. Um, in addition, uh, I want to talk about something called epistemic agency. Uh, so epistemology, right, comes from philosophy. It's sort of the, um, what does it mean to know things? Um, and so an epistemic agent, you could think of as someone who is responsible for shaping knowledge. And so this goes back to, I think it was Jay's comment that they're not actually using the labs to generate knowledge, they're using them to verify and confirm something that they sort of already know. Um, so in our capacitor lab, for example, it, it already gives information like the capacitor is polarized, the RC time constant should be this, um, your window should be this, and you should get this outcome, right? So everything is given to the students. The actual result that they're supposed to be getting in the lab is already given to them. Um, they are not legitimately using the data to actually generate information. Um, so when I think about agency, there's sort of these two pieces. One, um, this decision, what I'll call decision-making agency, are they actually making decisions about how to do the lab, but for the most part, decisions are kind of made for them. Um, and this epistemic agency, are they actually generating knowledge or is it just applied um, from somewhere else? Um, so those are my two things about agency. And we will, once I go through the three A's, then we will talk about what we actually do <laughs> with this. Um, oh, and then I guess the other piece, just to sort of comment on um, why is there so much structure in these labs? Why is it so um, canned and, you know? Um, and the, one of the things that I've been thinking about, in addition to just the notion that they want to apply, find some particular outcome, and so you want to make sure students get it, there's also sort of this issue of cognitive load that may come up in our conversation. So cognitive load is sort of the idea that you only have a fixed capacity in short-term memory, so you can only hold so much information in your brain at a time. Um, and in general, people sort of say high cognitive load is bad for learning, but that's really debated and has a lot of caveats and subtext and footnotes and all kinds of stuff. Um, but if we think about our capacitor lab again, right, we've got a circuit diagram that they have to translate, we've got computer software, we've got a bunch of cables and cords that they have to hook up to a bunch of things, we've got the idea of fitting, words like voltage and DMMs and, and all kinds of stuff. So you can certainly see that this reasonably could be a high cognitive load activity not to mention that they're also working in groups and teams and trying to collaborate that whole, whole mess of things. Um, and so I already said that. Uh, okay, so let's let's move on to authority and authenticity and then we can start talking about what we do with these issues. Yeah. So maybe you're gonna get to this, but I, I think there's a, another issue which is that uh, at institutions like this where there's a limited amount of lab space and a limited amount of TA, TA time, mm. you're trying to cram the labs into shorter periods than you might like if you had more resources. We will talk about that. Okay. Cool. Excited to talk about that. Okay. Um, so the issue of authority um, again goes back to this is sort of tied in with this idea of epistemic agency. This notion that students are sort of applying ideas that are learned previously in the lab to make predictions, explain the outcome of an experiment or whatever. But rarely are the experiments themselves actually generating new information. Sort of nothing is surprising in the labs, and if it is a surprise, at least in physics, it's human error and, and all sorts of things, right? Um, and the issue with this is that there's research that says that um, when surveyed, the majority of students think, introductory students, believe that the purpose of experiment is to confirm previously known results, uh, as opposed to discovery or whatever. Um, and furthermore, that experimental results should be evaluated on their agreement with your or previous results. So the whole point of doing an experiment is to get G and show whether or not it agrees with 9.8, which is a, which is a problem. Um, and these questions, um, the same ideas came up both when you ask students about what do you think about the labs versus what do you think about physics experiments. And that's the piece where students <coughs> get, get concerned. Yeah. I think students have a bad understanding of what the scientific method is. Absolutely. We are not helping. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of, sort of what we're finding. Yeah? Uh, my experience is most students don't know what a model is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, their, their understanding of physics is, you know, somewhere in a galaxy far, far away, there are a set of stone tablets. Yeah. And, you know, our job is to decipher those rather than, you know, figure out how to build a model out of our experience. Yeah. This is where I was uh, mentioning uh, to Beth earlier that one of my best TAs actually had a double major in physics and philosophy, and I was like, now we can talk. <laughs> um, so. And I want to just add another piece is that we've been collecting data, we've been observing students in the lab, and this idea of confirmation has also come up 
and that students engage in what we consider questionable research practices, such as massaging their data, refusing to seek disconfirmatory evidence, drawing conclusions that are unsupported by their data, and subjectively interpreting results. We have students literally say, we don't like our result. We're going to do something different to try to get um, a better result than we like, uh, which is kind of scary. Yeah. Are, are you going to talk about all about the difference between these sorts of can labs and sort of more research? Yeah. yeah. We will. We will get there. Um, and then, so the last issue um, is just sort of bring up this notion of authenticity, which I think is sort of where we're heading, this idea of are we actually teaching students what it is to do experimental science? Um, are we giving them sort of an authentic you know, glimpse into, into experimental science? Um, and, and I think something that we have to sort of disentangle is the idea of are we talking about an authentic sort of process, you know, what it means to it, the, the structure of how we do science, as opposed to what it is that we are actually investigating. Sort of an interesting thing to start talking about because um, I think a lot of people would probably argue that this capacitor lab is not particularly authentic in terms of what a physicist would do um, but it's it, not necessarily clear whether it's the structure or the fact that we're looking at capacitors um, and so uh, it's sort of unclear based on the research at this point whether the process needs to be authentic such as um, so there's in biology course-based undergraduate research experiences is a big popular thing right now where they have students, the idea is to engage students in authentic research um, to answer unknown and important, answer questions that are unknown and important to the scientific community as opposed to just sort of unknown to students, which I would sort of think of as sim simulating um, authentic research. Um, and that's sort of where I'm sitting right now and we can talk about that. Okay, so I've, I've sort of laid out some of the issues that I think are sort of the most important in this list is by no means complete, but it seems to be sufficient. Um, so let's talk a little bit about what we do about this now. Okay, um, and so there's a couple of things that we've been thinking about, and so one of them, just thinking about providing um, agency to our students, is uh, we do things like focus on the, the process of the, what they're doing in the labs as opposed to the product, and so I have to very quickly disentangle sort of, I don't care what they find, as long as it is supported by evidence and a reasonable method and justifications and all of that stuff. Um, in terms of the instructions, we've been um, turning statements into questions to try to get some of that decision-making agency. So for example, rather than saying, take 10 trials, I will ask them, how many trials are you gonna take? How will you know if it's enough? Um, or how will you know if you need to do more? Um, so it's cueing them about what decisions need to be made without giving them, without making the decision for them. Um, and then uh, we often, as I'll show in my next slide, we also often encourage them to iterate on that, sort of to reflect on, was that a good decision? And then, uh, you know, why? And then if it wasn't, can you make a better decision and maybe improve? Uh, if 10 trials wasn't enough, take the 15 or however many more you need. Um, and then we use labs where there is no right answer to try to get at that epistemic agency. Um, and so none of our labs verify gravity, that is, um, was a big no-no immediately. Um, I'll give some examples of what we've been doing. Um, and then we fade some of it, so especially the statements into questions, we sort of fade that structure over time. So by the end of the couple labs, we'll sort of stop telling them, we'll stop queuing those decisions and sort of see if they're making them on their own. Um, and then to start to address the time thing, I'm gonna throw this nugget in now, um, that we spread individual labs over multiple sections. So rather than a new topic every two weeks, we admit that science is slow and takes time, and if they mess up their decisions, we want them to be able to improve on them. Um, and so we'll spend four weeks um, on a single, or two weeks on a single activity, or whatever it might be, to sort of give them that time, which, because I don't care about their product, um, sort of allows me to do that. I don't need to cover 10 different lab activities because they're not gonna learn that content anyway, so we may as well go deep into a couple fun, fun experiments. Are these all introductory labs? At the moment, these are introductory, but we've applied this to upper division because courses as well. Because we do this well. sort of thing very similarly to our upper division labs, but Great. not our introductory labs. Yeah, so we've, we've applied this sort of at both um, ends of the spectrum at this point, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and so one of the big things that I claim that these labs are teaching is uh, critical thinking, which is a wonderful buzzword with no clear definition. So again, my working definition is um, critical thinking involves the evidence-based ways um, in which you decide what to trust and what to do. Um, so evidence-based obviously being that I want them to collect data and be able to have evidence to support their decisions. Um, there's a lot of decision-making which brings up the agency piece again. Um, and then what to trust 
is sort of this idea of actually analyzing data and making sense of that evidence, uh, as well as evaluating the methods. Um, and then what to do is actually being able to carry out the experiment and sort of move forward with that information. Um, and just to really flesh out my saleswoman pitch, uh, we have a three-step process to teaching critical thinking, uh, which involves these three pieces. We have students make comparisons, reflect on those comparisons, and then make decisions about uh, how to act on them, so what to do with it. Um, and so I will give an example of what this looks like in our physics lab, and then hopefully we can think about some other contexts. Okay, so my favorite lab is our first lab of the semester, which is a period of a pendulum lab, where we ask students the question, does the period of a pendulum differ when released from different amplitudes? And we constrain them to test 10 and 20 degrees. Um, and so the equation that they've seen in class is this one, the period is two pi times the square root of the length of the period divided by gravitational acceleration, which suggests that there is no angle dependence. So the answer to this question could just be no, look at the formula. <laughs> um, but obviously we get them to actually collect data to test this. Um, and we're very careful with our language. We say the words test or evaluate um, as opposed to confirm or show. Um, so the first thing we do, right, we've already sort of set up this comparison for students that they're gonna collect data for the period of pendulum at 10 degrees and then 20 degrees and then compare them. Um, we don't really tell them how to collect that data. They're given stopwatches and they have to set up the pendulums themselves. Um, and so they have to make all these decisions and this is where our questions come in about how many trials are you gonna do, how many swings are you gonna do between them, how are you gonna quantify uncertainty and variability, a bunch of stuff. Um, so we'll go through a quick case study of one of the groups of students. So they opted to just measure the time for single periods. So the pendulum would be out here, they'd press start, they would swing through one period, they'd press stop, record that number, repeat 10 times, they got the mean and standard error, and then they do it again for the next, for the 20 degree release or whatever. And so the data that this group got was 1.84 plus or minus 0.08, and then 1.81 plus or minus 0.08, and if you compare those, that sort of differs by 0 0.2 sigma. So 0 0.2 units of uncertainty is the difference between that, which if you were just looking at sort of do the error bars overlap, they overlap, right, like that's that. So then we've done this comparison, now we want the students to reflect on it. So we will explicitly prompt them, you know, reflect on your comparison, what did you get, whatever. Um, so the 0 0.2 sigma, uh, we, we sort of, we call this a T prime. So uh, the idea is that they've taken the difference between the two periods divided by the uncertainty. And so if we think that 0 0.2 is relatively small, you can imagine getting a small difference because the periods are actually close or the same, right? The numerator is small or that the uncertainty is just really large. I can make this number arbitrarily small if my denominator is really, really big, which is the equivalent of, you know, two points are like this, but if you inflate those error bars, they will look similar, right? Okay, um, so then we have to act on the comparison. Now that we've sort of decided there's maybe two options, I have to decide what to do. So um, this is what they did just to remind you. So they had the time for single periods, did this 10 times and found the average, thank you, and standard error. Um, so first of all, thinking about your introductory physics students or introductory lab students, what do they want to do next? Option one is maybe take more trials, two, measure more swings per trial, three, use a photo gate instead of a stopwatch, four, measure another angle, or five, write it up, list their sources of error, and go home. <laughs> on three, one, two, three. <laughs> okay, now we finally have consensus in the room. <laughs> Students want to go home. <laughs> why? What are some of the reasons why they want to go home? There are many. Yeah. Because it's close enough. Because it's it's close enough. It's close enough. It's one point eighty one and one point eighty four go to the second uh, decimal. It's one point eight. It's one point eight. And um, up to probably introductory physics physics class, they didn't um, worry about the second decimal. Mm -hmm. They don't know actually what the importance of that. Mm -hmm. So, so they got answers that agree, and that's good. Yeah, I think that's good. Like first of the list of sources of error, like human error stuff, whatever. Mm -hmm. Like it was called, it was with the mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. drafts in the room, all that stuff. Yeah. Other stuff? Why? Yeah. My answer is easy because it's not required. We don't have the agency of continue to, you know. Yeah. yeah. Why should I do anything else? Yeah. <laughs> 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 what? Yeah, other stuff? Did you have one time? 
Oh no, I was just gonna say because they have beer at home, but yeah. Because they have beer at home, yeah, right? There's dinner and food and other things. I don't have to be here, why wouldn't I be there? And why do I care about pendulums in the first place? Right, talk about authenticity, right? Like nobody cares about pendulums. Yeah, and, and just sort of to add on to that one, um, they confirmed the equation, right? The textbook said it shouldn't matter, they got data that says it doesn't matter, the world works, let's get out of here, right? Cool. Okay, what could they do next? So as inherently curious scientists, what would you do next? Same five options. Um, on three, one, two, three. Okay, and this is where a bunch of people realize that they have two hands. <laughs> right, so any of these, again, we've lost consensus, but any of these are reasonable options. And even five is a reasonable option, depending on your goal. Um, but, but what's really neat here, thinking about agency, right? This is a very constrained lab, right? I said, measure the period of a pendulum and test it at 10 and 20 degrees. You can't get much more constrained than that. And yet, there's a ton of decision-making space, right? In our groups, everyone can try something different. They can see what happens. There's a ton of things. Um, and so at this point, we really, we have to sort of um, go against this notion that students want to just go home. And so we require them to do sort of a second iteration um, based on their results. Um, and students, and we focus in this lab on trying to reduce your uncertainty because that's the piece that students don't know that they actually can do a good job in the lab, and so that's the first thing that we push is just getting the precision down. Did yep. you leave this open-ended, or did you give them these? No, we left it open-ended. And so students will come up with things, you know, they'll come up with this list, but then they'll also come up with things like, we're gonna, you know, put tape on the ground so we can be really accurate about when it crosses the point and when to press the button. Um, we've done things like getting rid of the air resistance and stuff, so students will like put coats up around and try to block drafts of air across the room. Um, and then my favorite one, which is, we're not going to let so-and-so time anymore because he keeps messing up. <laughs> <laughs> That's legitimate. Right? That's fair. Yeah. How are these labs graded? Oh, yeah, we'll save that for the end. <laughs> That's a whole other thing. Okay. So let me just show you the data that they got just so that we can um, finish this through. So this group of students that we've been looking at decided to measure more swings per trial. And so by the end of it, they were measuring the time for 20 periods. So they'd let it go, press start, let it swing through 20 periods, and press stop. So their uncertainty goes down by a factor of 20 on the measurement for a single period. Um, and now they've got this number way out at 3.7 sigma. So in particle physics, that's still kind of marginal. But for a behavioral scientist, that's like really significant, right? Key way less than point one. Point one. Um, and so on the next slide, I'll show you the conclusions that one of these students wrote in their lab book after this experience. So he says, the opposite of the expected happened. T improved is greater than 3. The measured values are different. Conclusion, the period of a pendulum does depend on the angle with the vertical in the initial position. The algebraically derived formula for the period is approximately 2 pi root L over G of a pendulum is only valid for small angles. Considering the results of this experiment, 20 degrees is obviously not small enough since the angle has an effect on the period T and should be somehow represented in the formula. If you can make a precise enough measurement, you can show that the theoretical derivation of an equation of motion for a pendulum is just a good approximation. In reality, it's slightly more complicated. Not bad. Not bad. This is week, yeah. week three, I think, of our course. Yeah. Um, and before anyone asks, this is a beautiful example. It is not a typical example. <laughs> <laughs> Full disclosure. Um, but it was wonderful. And for me, this piece, right, when we think about this, my definition of critical thinking, they made a series of decisions and thought about what to trust, right? They tie in this idea of, of precision is related to the sort of depth of physics that I'll be able to uncover. Um, this sort of combination of actually really what does it mean to trust data sort of starts to bubble up um, in this, which is really nice. Are you sure that the student didn't read the Wikipedia before seeing this? I promise you they did not. We actually, at this point, we were um, asking students not to look up um, the answers. And in particular, right, the opposite of the expected happened, right? This student went in expecting them to be the same and then found that they were not. Um, this student at least was aware of the small angle approximation, so clearly had some content knowledge but they still expected that it wouldn't matter, um, which is sort of a critical piece here. Um, <coughs> it's such a fun lab to do with them. So what, what, what percent of the population is representing? Yeah. It wasn't everybody, but... Yeah, it's like 10%, unfortunately. Okay. Um, but we've been sort of looking at trying some other, other pieces out. Um, and I've got data that shows that it improves over time, though. Um, one, of, one of the reasons I think it is so rare is that, um, as I said, this, this um, desire to confirm, very few students actually push past um, the, you know, you, you need a level of precision to actually get this result. So very few students actually even get the result because of all of these, these sort of confirmation issues. So 
Um, we've got we've been studying this pendulum a lot because it's my absolute favorite. Um, and watching students with that struggle, we push them to decrease their uncertainty. And we've got data where students, as their uncertainty gets lower and lower, um, this is where they start to say, we don't like this result. This is disagreeing with the formula. And so we're just gonna go back to the other thing. And so they'll actually, this is where they've been fudging their data and all of this kind of stuff, because they think the goal is to confirm the equation. And so we then follow this up with a debrief and a conversation about ethics and science and, and all of that stuff. So it's, I, oh, yeah. This I was gonna ask you along those lines, do you find an increase in agency as they do more of these kinds of things? Yeah, that's the second part of the talk that I'm already running out of time to get to. So <laughs> there's one more question in the back. So, I, it's a two-part question. Do you do less? Do I? Yeah. Um, <coughs> I have, and I no longer do. Do you? Do you uh, we have studied them with and without Natasha. Have you thought about like demonstrating how someone who has you know, who's a professional experimental scientist would do this lab and what kind of results they might get? So we've been toying with a ton of things with this pendulum lab about how to structure it. So one of my games right now is what happens if I just tell them what the assumptions of this model are? Will that change their behavior to recognize that models are limited? Um, I also, a part of me thinks that this is a really big teachable moment and that to just let this happen and then talk about it afterwards is gonna be well, better for their learning. Let them do it, but then, but then talk about it, yeah. It. Which is why we now have this explicit de debrief the following week and we get them to reflect on, we basically tell them the answer in this case and then okay. and then we talk about what just happened. So, yeah. I'm gonna move on because there's a lot of other stuff. I wanna actually show data, but, um, oh, I forgot to mention, uh, no one picked up on the fact that you can actually say that it's a small angle approximation by measuring two angles. Um, but if you actually plot the, we get them to plot sort of um, angle, period as a function of angle, and they pick out that, that second order of behavior, which is good. Um, and I'm going to skip this. Um, just to mention a couple of the other stuff that we've been doing. So as the, this one is still pretty um, contained in terms of epistemic agency because I, I want them to have this sort of conflicting experience. So I, there really is an outcome that I want them to get at the end. Um, and so we've been sort of playing with other things um, a lot inspired by uh, Eugenie Ekin and um, what's his name, Alan Van Hoogelen's work at Rutgers. Um, so one of our things is falling objects. We have students test a model that um, the gravitational force is the only thing acting on uh, falling objects, and they test it with different things where that may or may not be true, but everyone does something different, and we've got these big sort of mini conferences, and then they try to improve the model for various objects. Um, our favorite one is a Hooke's Law experiment where we first just sort of do an exercise in fitting and residuals, give them springs and test Hooke's Law, F equals KX, show them it's linear, all good. Now bring me things from home and everyone gets to test some stuff to see if how well it behaves um, or where it breaks down with Hooke's Law. So really bringing in those things because I don't know when a student brings in their swimming goggles with an elastic rubbery band. I have no idea if that obeys Hooke's Law or not, let's find out. Um, so they do lots of cool stuff. Um, in E&M, we've been doing uh, Ohm's laws where they test the degree to which resistors, light bulbs, or LEDs obey Ohm's law and then try to understand when they break down. Um, and then our other one, again, drawing on Eugenia Akina's stuff, she's got a series of things on LEDs because they're crazy. Um, and so we show basically show them some weird stuff that LEDs do and ask them, what does this thing do? And um, they've got to develop a bunch of experiments to figure it out. Okay, um, how quickly can I go through data? So I think I can get through it in about five minutes if I go really fast, um, just to show. Go, look, you can go like 10 minutes. Okay, okay. Um, just to show you some of the evidence, some of the stuff that we've been looking at. Um, so the data that I'm gonna pull on now comes from actually three different institutions and a bunch of different studies, so I thought I'd put it all together at first. Um, so we've been testing things at Cornell, so we've been changing these labs and doing some pretty tightly controlled um, studies. So uh, my students, Martin, and my postdoc, Emily, um, working on this a bunch where we had students in the first semester, actually we, we had five sections of the course, this was physics majors, five sections of the course where three of them were sort of the business as usual traditional labs and two of them were our change labs. So we've got some nice direct comparisons of content knowledge and stuff like that. Um, University of British Columbia, when I was a PhD student, the data where we did sort of two cohorts. So the first year was business as usual and then we revamped up the second year. Um, that was a combination of calculus-based courses, but a um, combination of life science students and physics majors. Um, and then a, a community college in California um, where we did, we had two cohorts and then I think a traditional cohort from the year before. Um, and we had a bunch of stuff. Okay. 
Okay, so the first question was just to go back to this idea of does this change in instructional methods impact content knowledge? Um, and our prediction from the previous study was that it wouldn't, but of course in this case we had the selection effect which we accounted for, but now at Cornell we were able to just directly compare students in the same cohort um, who had been random, essentially randomly assigned to the two different types of labs. Um, so we can actually do a direct comparison, in this case on their final exam scores, and sure enough, their exam scores are pretty much identical to the two distributions of students. I don't even have a legend to say which one is which, but they're the same, so it doesn't matter. Um, which is as expected, so that's good. Uh, the other piece is going to the attitude, so we gave our students at Cornell the um, E-class survey, um, so that was the graph that I showed you before. Um, I replotted it with error bars, and you'll see why in a moment. So this is, um, they had their standard errors in the plot. I took out the both, I just wanted to compare the concepts and skills groups. Um, so that's what their data, and they had in this population, it's um, about 1,500 students. Uh, and so when we do this, our control group will be the first one, and then we've got two iterations of our new labs um, following. So our, with only uh, 40 students per group, our error bars are way bigger. Um, but you can actually see that the size of the effect is pretty similar between the two institutions, which is good. So we'll be collecting more data um, to sort of keep tracking this. And then the last one is, um, if we've been teaching this sort of critical thinking and other experimentation behaviors, does it actually improve their behaviors? So a couple of the ways that we've done this. The first um, is one of the pieces is just this idea of getting students to actually iterate on what they're doing. Um, so from the pendulum lab, for example, they went from single swing to 20, period, 20 swing measurements. Um, we've also seen, you know, just sort of on the fly decisions, you know, this data point looks weird, we're gonna check it again, um, or whatever it might be. And these students were all writing um, lab notebooks, and so documenting their whole process, sort of like a journal, what they were doing and why they're doing it throughout. And so what we pulled up was, um, so in the yellow is gonna be that the student made some sort of proposal about a way to improve their experiment, and then blue is that they also went and did it, actually implemented that change. Um, and so any quick guesses, I think I took out this slide, but I'm gonna throw it up because I think it's helpful. Um, any quick guesses what fraction of students in the control group who were never told to iterate or improve their methods, what fraction of them do you expect to either propose or actually carry out a change in their methods? Less than 25%, between 25 and 50, between 50 and 75, or more than 75% on three. One, two, three. Whoa, we are at pretty much unanimous again with ones with a couple people being really optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> this is what we have. Um, and so this is the, what we you know talked about before, that the students just want to get out of there and go home. They don't have any reason to think to do this. Um, in the pendulum lab, when we tell them to do it, they do, and then that sort of carries as the instruction gets faded um, over time. So we sort of, by um, week 17, we had really stopped telling them to engage in this. So the numbers drop, but it's pretty sustained. And then we followed our physics majors into the um, second year course, um, and these behaviors sort of kept up when we weren't involved in the design or anything. The, um, oh, and then we've done a similar thing at um, Cornell, and between the couple different iterations that we've coded, there seems to be a ton of variability over the labs, which we're gonna sort of start to try to understand when do they and when don't they. Um, but clearly, again, the numbers are still way above what it was for the control group, so good things are happening. Um, the other thing we've been looking at is um, these, these situations where the data sort of disagrees with the, what they expect. So do they, when these sort of models disagree with their data, um, how do they sort of disentangle that? Um, so yellow is that they actually just identify and recognize that there is an issue, um, as opposed to just trying to sweep it under the rug. Um, and then blue is that they also go ahead and sort of try to interpret that and make, make sense of it. Um, and so this is the, what happens at the beginning of the semester, so that um, this is the pendulum lab, so that beautiful description that we saw when I said that it was rare, right? Like that's that guy <laughs> in there, right? It's really not happening. Um, but by the end of the semester, we sort of get them used to it and engaging in this process. One of the things that I think is this authority piece that at the beginning, they are really holding on to these ideas that the equation and the, the laws laid out for them in the textbook are truth, but over time we're sort of teaching them that they are the authority, the data is the authority, um, whatever that may be. So that's one of the pieces that we're gonna be sort of trying to disentangle a little bit more. So, sorry, what is this? This is time? Yeah, so we've got week two and then we jump to week 17 um, and then the sophomore lab at the end there. 
looks like there's a peak in there. Pardon? Looks like there's a there's an increase and then decrease. That, um, yeah, so the sophomore lab is the students the following semester in a totally different course. Um, so it's sort of a yeah, yeah. Why the control lab uh, for week 17 is not all identified in the third uh, Right. So what we think is that for the students who actually recognized that there was something wrong, they would they were able to figure it out. Okay, sort of thing. Yeah, it was higher in week two anyway. So. But these yeah. kids are living in Within. the dorms with each other too, right? Yeah. They're probably talking to each other too. In this case, the control and the experiment were um, oh, one different cohort years? after the other. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So there shouldn't be that talking. To okay. Um, and then, we, yeah, we've done this at uh, Cornell as well, whoops, and it's uh, sort of the same thing. So um, the other piece is we've been, so coding through all these lab books is super tedious. Um, great project for a PhD student, not great for anybody else. Um, and so we've been designing what we think uh, is an assessment of critical thinking, we claim. The idea is that it's usable by instructors in different courses at different institutions um, to assess critical thinking in an efficient and sort of standardized way. Um, so the assessment, gives students two um, sort of case studies of groups conducting an experiment of a mass on a spring, and then ask them, you know, going back to my definition of critical thinking, the sort of how do you trust things, and then what do you do about it? So they evaluate the data, and sort of the quality of the fits that students create, they evaluate their methods, and then make suggestions about what the groups should do next. Um, and so overall, uh, what we find looking at these, so far with the data that we've collected, um, our labs and the ones that sort of aim to teach critical thinking have these sort of small positive shifts in student score from the beginning to end of the semester, whereas other courses um, sort of don't have any anything and will again be sort of disentangling this over time. But this is a survey if you're interested in using this with your students, you're welcome to. Uh, we're also currently creating one um, in ecology, it will be called the Ecoblick, the ecology, or the biology lab inventory of critical thinking for ecology, uh, and maybe some other ones. Um, and I am going to skip over this stuff because we are running out of time. Uh, it's just a bunch more data that shows that we figured stuff out. Um, so just to sort of wrap up and then we can take more questions and conversations. Uh, going back to the sort of our definitions of these traditional labs, right, it starts to sort of become clear some of the options forward about what to do, um, thinking about agency authority and authenticity. Um, so obviously, whoops, ignore that thing on the side. I forgot to fix that. Um, uh, obviously, giving students agency is going to be a good thing. Um, placing the sort of knowledge authority on the students' process and their data rather than the sort of right answer in the textbook. Um, and then simulating authentic experimentation. All well and good. How do we actually do that? So a couple of the strategies for, removing, for giving agency is to remove some of the structure, let students make decisions in a constrained space, the sort of turning statements into questions, um, and then spreading labs over multiple sessions is very important to actually give them the time to engage in that process. Um, to place the authority on students' process and data, use experiments where students don't necessarily know the answer, um, and especially I think some labs where the experimental result might be surprising to them to kind of keep them on their feet. Um, and then reflecting authentic experimentation, focus on the process rather than the product, um, and then use experiments for discovery rather than confirmation. Easy, right? <laughs> Uh, and then again, just to sort of acknowledge all the people. Uh, thank you very much, and I'm happy to continue the discussion and take questions. Of the pendulum themselves, they set up and there are rulers in the room. Um, <laughs> but, um, since they set up it, and probably um, so, you can easily treat that uh, pendulum as a manufacturable thing, since it has a dimension and it will be a manufacturable variable, and um, it will be uh, it won't be like ten centimeters or like ten inches specifically. Mm -hmm. So. Um, do, do they consider about those uncertainties that is already in the experiment, other than human error and stuff like that? Because like pi, it's um, if you use the scientific calculator pi, it's 15 digits, but if you want to use like 14, it's something. And the gravitational acceleration 
it's also different. So, uh, are you aware of that before starting the experiment, or? Uh, um, in this case, they're not actually they're they're actually told to measure it right because they have to compare it ten and twenty, right? So, just measuring the length and calculating the period doesn't allow you to do a comparison of ten and twenty. Um, so, they have to just use the stopwatch to measure it implicitly. So, in this case, we sort of avoid that piece because they're supposed to measure it directly using the stopwatches. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's do some people we have for now. Yeah. So what other environmental factors are in this setting? For instance, this is looking at um, the constraints or lack of constraints or across that spectrum for the written materials. You have the students in various kinds of classes. Um, well, who else is circulating in these classes? Is an instructor circulating? Are there multiple structures in, circ cir in circulation? Because one of the things we've been looking at is the role of those instructors circulating and how is what those instructors say, how does that influence the experimentation? Yeah, so um, in the different institutions where we've tried this, we've had a variety of instructor to student ratios. So um, we've had everything from 50 student rooms with two graduate TAs to at Cornell. Uh, Foothill, I think, was 30 students and one faculty instructor. And then Cornell, we've got 20 to 25 students. Um, and we've tried both with one graduate student and with one graduate student and an undergraduate TA. And I think that the undergraduate TAs are great, so I will keep them around as long as I can. Um, partly because they, we take them as students who have taken the labs before, and so they're sort of bought in and know what's happening and have sort of some enthusiasm. In terms of what they actually do, that is a whole, probably a whole other research talk. <laughs> um, and it's, it's complicated, and the idea right, of giving, giving students agency, I think, can be um, <coughs> many of our instructors and TAs have never experienced a learning environment like this. Um, and so getting them sort of on board and comfortable in this environment, let alone knowing how to actually support students through that process is a, is a, whole, is a whole thing. Um, one of the big pieces, and this sort of ties into someone asked about grading, and I tried to avoid that. Um, <laughs> one of the um, big things that we draw on is actually from uh, the Alan Schoenfeld metacognition stuff, the three questions, what are you doing, why are you doing it, and what are you gonna do next? Um, so we sort of follow from him and we tell the TAs to, and the students that the TAs should be walking around and asking those three questions and so the students should know answer to those um, at any time. And we actually use that also in our grading. So what are you doing, right, is a clear description of their experimental process and throughout the whole time. Why are you doing it is justification. I want to make sure that you're actually thinking about why you're doing what you're doing. Um, and then what are you doing next is trying to get into that idea of iteration. How will this feed into the next step um, and keep them going? So that's been... We could keep talking forever about that, probably. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My Someone cut me off. Tell me when I need to stop. The way. example you illustrated here is good. Like you can give the students to explore in that way. Mm -hmm. But in my lab, which I'm going to introduce, I'm, I'm starting with some different mm -hmm. drawings, so it will help me to structure. So there are certain living organisms or certain instructions that they haven't done lab before. We want to teach them. Then is it okay for you to take a line of those instructions and then later ask them to or do if you can do some fun experiments using non toxic materials? Yeah, so um, it, as I understand, the question sort of relates to you know there are procedures that we want students to be able to learn actual technical procedures, which does not really lend itself to agency that well. Uh, so that certainly is a is a third sort of set of goals that I haven't really talked about. Um, but I think there are depending on. And I think one of the things that physics doesn't always have to real worry about is safety, um, right? Like we're not dealing with chemicals and radioactive, I mean, sometimes we're dealing with radioactive, but for the most part, things are relatively safe and students can try out some weird stuff and it'll be a waste of time, but it'll be fine, no one's gonna get hurt, um, uh, which is not the case in every every discipline. So um, I think with that, you know, that's a, you know, teaching procedures, technical procedures is sort of another whole piece of the puzzle. Um, one of the arguments when I was working with folks during my postdoc in a, a upper division, I think it was a sort of biological and chemical engineering course that used to be very focused on procedures. The instructors I were working with had a really nice perspective of, you know, we don't know what procedures are gonna be useful to these students 10, 15, 20 years down the line. And so the thing that we wanted, they wanted to teach was 
critical thinking, the idea of we want them to know how to approach a new piece of equipment and think about it, and these things do still apply in that, in that case. Um, so it's sort of a question of just what your goals are, I think. Uh, Hold on one minute. Yeah. We actually, it's, it's past one. We intended the talk to go for an hour, but we have actually booked the room for another hour because we thought people might want to hang out. So feel free to leave. If you have to leave, I know it's the end of the semester and there's a lot to do. But if you can stay, I think we should just continue in this format right now until all the questions are answered and then you can talk. So if you need to leave, leave. But if you want to stay, then we're going to continue for a while. Okay, cool. Now you can ask. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so I think authenticity is something I want to ask about because um, Osborne talked about the scientific inquiry versus inquiry learning. They're different. Yeah. We, we cannot pretend that students don't know the answer, right? So they, uh, they have already the information and they have access to like Wikipedia yeah. about a small angle approximation. Yeah. So how do you, you know, handle that challenge? Right? Yeah. So, um, so the if people didn't hear the question, so the the idea of sort of this epistemic agency, you know. Having experiments where students legitimately don't know the answer is hard because there's Wikipedia and Google and the internet and information is, is readily available, right, all, everywhere. Um, so we've, we've been trying to actually think about this and so this is where we've started changing some of our labs where we wanna actually make the answer and my definition is not Googleable. Um, and so the, the Hooke's Law Lab, for example, is, has been the one that's worked sort of the best. This idea of letting students bring in materials from home they can't Google what is the spring constant of the elastic band on swimming goggles. It's just, I mean, I'm sure someone somewhere has done this and it exists somewhere on the internet, but it's not a thing that's going to give them the answer for their set of swimming goggles right now. Um, and even the period of a pendulum, yeah, they can pull up the small angle approximation, but even though students know the small angle approximation, they still don't expect that result. Um, so there are some pieces that I think it's still possible to sort of do it, but Certainly the bringing stuff in from home has been really good. Um, the falling objects one, um, uh, so we have the students testing um, the, uh, whether gravity is the only force acting on things falling, but there's also drag and buoyancy and a bunch of other things. Um, but one of the pieces that we get is not only what is the force, but we want you to actually create a model. What is the size of the effect, right? Is it, what does it depend on and all of these other things? And so we give them you know, a beach ball and then a basketball and I don't remember what the other thing is, something else, tennis ball or something. Um, and they have to repeat it on the different people have to do it on the different instruments. And so, you know, one group is going to get one thing, another group's going to get something else. And we're literally a community of learners here trying to sort of come to consensus. So we, we really are deliberately trying to find labs that aren't Googleable, which again may or may not be easier in, depending on the, <coughs> on the discipline. But I know in chemistry, I mean, one of the, um, probably one of the best labs that I heard of or that I, maybe did as an undergrad, right, is this like, what's in the bottle, <laughs> everybody? Here's a thing, you've got to figure out what's in it, right? Like that is a, a relatively authentic, you know, they can't look it up, you've got to just collect data. And in that case, looking it up is only to find other resources that will support and help explain your evidence, right? That is a totally legitimate sort of experimental procedure. Um, I'm sorry, I see this question has taken part. And also, we know that Felix labs, sometimes the results are you know, highly affected by the lab the equipment. Yeah. Like they, uh, the, the motion acceleration, yeah. you know, motion sensor, it sometimes create, you know, builds create, you know, crazy maps. Yeah. So in that case, how do the students know the result is because of lab errors and or some, you know, real laws of theories? Which again is the, how did the students, I'm rephrasing your question, how did the students decide what to trust? Yeah. Right, and that is now a feature of the lab, not a bug. And so that's why at the beginning of the semester, we focus a lot on the idea of uncertainty. How do you quantify things? We've got a lot of stuff on data analysis. How do you make quantifiable sort of objective claims about what's happening? And so if you get a thing with really messy data, we don't want you to just brush that under the rug. We want you to now either figure out, can you get this better? Is this precise enough for your purposes? Whatever it might be. So it's, again, we turn all of that variability and frustratingness into a feature for the lab. I think you had your hand up for a while. There. I, I think that might be doing this, uh, and this might be an extension of what you're doing. But are you also considering taking what you're doing in the lab to the lecture and not making a distinction between lecture and lab, just having a class where sort of theory and experiment and everything go together? Great question. Um, so uh, the question is, uh, 
should can we or should we be moving what we're doing in the lab into the lecture? Um, and the the desire to teach content is the thing that stops me from pulling it into the lecture. As soon as I have a desire that I want them to actually know F equals MA, then a lot of this all of a sudden rem totally removes that epistemic. <coughs> um, the product all of a sudden matters again. Um, so at this point, to push it really, really, you know, to really get what I think is sort of authentic, simulated um, experimentation time, I, I revel in the fact that the lab is separate um, from, the, from the lecture in order to achieve that. That's not to say that it can't be done, that's not to say it shouldn't be done, I don't know, but at least <coughs> logistically, it's way easier for me to, you know, and also just to convince the students and get their buy-in that, you know, when you walk into this room, you are scientists and you are going to be experimenting and try to uncover things that you don't know the answer to and, and data rules in this in this space as opposed to, to theory in the other space. But that's not to say that it can't, but we've found it way easier to just keep those disentangled. Yeah. The first is a comment about this discussion. Yeah. And I think one way to approach that, bringing in the lecture is to have a flipped model or a blended model where you deliver the content online and have them come prepared. And then you can do, you'd have more time. Mm -hmm. So that's one way to approach mm -hmm. that. Uh, the second thing is, uh, I really like the debriefing, you know, with the, the experiments. And I, but I think you could also, without giving them answers, front load it a little bit by talking about the nature of science issues. I mean, our scientists, our science students don't know that. Yeah. They don't know what it, the nature of science is. You know, it's empirical, based on laws and theories, and subject to change, and it's creative. And you're going to have to do all this stuff. You have to know a difference between observation and inference. But if you pick a couple of those ideas, just reminded them before they started, maybe they would, yeah. Yeah, um, so it's, it's interesting. So I mean, full disclosure, one of the first activities we do is sort of an icebreaker and get to know you at the TA is we give them big whiteboards and say, what is, uh, what is our question? What, how do we do experiments in physics? I think that's the question that we ask. Yeah. And we have them sort of create you know, flow charts or representations or whatever it might be to sort of go through that. And we've also toyed with other questions like how do we know things? And, Again, my philosophy is starting to, <laughs> to creep into my class. Um, uh, and so we, we do try to open that up. Um, but I guess I, I come from, um, uh, we really enjoy the work of, I've, I've been following a lot the work of um, Dan Schwartz at Stanford um, in the Graduate School of Education, who does this sort of, uh, his <laughs> type of instruction is invention as preparation for future learning. And so the framework, thinking about flipped, but it's uh, even more flipped again, but, uh, having students just sort of do an open-ended um, task that where there really isn't sort of it's ill-structured and there isn't this right answer and then follow it up with the reflection rather than one before the other um, in a lot of different ways sort of is, is better for students learning down the line. So for me it's sort of I'd rather them just discover and fail and flounder and then we'll, we'll tie the pieces <coughs> afterwards um, rather than sort of leading them down a path. But, but I mean that to be said we could do the experiment certainly and see what happens. Okay, let's go How do you train your TAs? Like, <laughs> we've all been taught traditional apps. And, yeah. Like, what is the training to get them to be useful in this uh, setting? Yeah, good question. Um, so that's uh, that's an ongoing uh, pursuit. Certainly, as I said, it's it's. Uh, I think we'll spend years trying to sort of iron that out um, because in this context, right, we're not only trying to teach the pedagogy and how do you actually facilitate and help students. Uh, but also for a lot of the case, these students, RTAs, haven't had this kind of instruction. They don't know the content. They don't know a lot of the things um, that we're trying to talk about. So um, at the moment, the way that we're playing is just that we have weekly meetings where uh, the instructor will sort of play TA and the TAs play students, and we just go through the activity. Um, but we also have them, uh, we give them a, a sheet of paper that has a table where the left-hand column is the instructions that the students will see, so they're gonna just sort of go through the lab with those instructions, but the next two columns are blank. The middle one is, um, what issues are you having? What questions do you have? What do you think your students are gonna stumble on? You know, What problems are they gonna run into? And then the third column is, what will you as an instructor sort of do to support your students in that? So the idea is that we want them to go through the lab so that we make sure that they sort of have that content knowledge, but we also want them sort of meta and reflecting on what will my role in the room be during this time, and then we sort of debrief it afterwards. Um, but, yeah. Shameless plug, if you're interested specifically, you can come to the TLPDC or uh, send me an email, 
and we can talk specifically about helping the training graduate students. Nice. Thank you. Other questions? So you mentioned doing your, you didn't use the break, giving your students a safe space to fail, but you kind of mentioned that. How do you encourage your students to fail? I'm coming from an advanced chemistry lab, yeah. so I know it's going to be different because some failures can be a safety issue, yeah. but the ones that aren't, <laughs> <laughs> the, ones, the, ones, okay. the ones that are not, yeah. how, do you, how do you encourage your students oh, yeah. to fail without kind of internalizing that as them being the failure? It's just maybe they made some poor decisions or they didn't do enough trials or whatever. How do you how do you yeah. foster that kind of curious it's okay to fail environment? I think the short answer is I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> um, because it's it's really hard for students, I think, to get used to that, right? This whole idea of they expect I mean, I went into science because it was objective, right? There's a right answer. <laughs> Turns out that is not what science is about at all, right? And so it's a huge shift for students to get into this mode of I don't possibly know what the answer is here. And, and full disclosure, I have made students cry in my lab <laughs> because they get so unsettled yeah. and so uncomfortable with the idea that they don't know the answer um, to what might be happening. So um, I, I don't know. I think it's a balance of friendly faces and making sure there's a lot of teamwork and no sort of onus on individuals I think becomes really important. Um, and constant like proclaiming of there is no right answer here. We want you to be creative. You will get graded for your process, not your product. You know, just constantly spouting all of the stuff that I've already said, just over and over and over again, um, and and appropriate grading and balanced incentives and all of that stuff. But um, it's it's hard, um, but something that we'll be sort of studying a little bit more about how to really, you know, those first couple of days I think are really crucial to to get people comfortable. Um, and, and especially, I'm a little bit cautious, the debrief that we do with the pendulum, right? A lot of the students actually finish the pendulum lab having confirmed the equation in the book. And so then sort of revealing like, surprise, haha, not actually, <laughs> um, can, can sort of be jarring. And we haven't quite monitored that moment yet. And so we need to, I actually have video of a student, I don't think I have it handy, um, a video of a group who have been adamantly like, you know, fudging data and doing a bunch of stuff to try to confirm <laughs> to confirm the answer, and then all of a sudden a group over here on like the corner of the screen sort of complains. This guy like gives up. He's like, "Fine, I I, I give up. The periods are different. You know, I, we've got four sigma." And this group like who had been fudging the data and doing all this stuff like give themselves this look like the world has just like shattered around them. Um, and so figuring out how to how to support them through that, pick themselves up. I think after that will be an interesting sort of thing to start to. Oh, I think, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I had a couple questions, and yeah. I think they're all short. Okay. Okay, so one is, um, would this uh, lead to recommendation that if students pass the AP test, that they should still have to take the lab? We are toying with that idea right now. Yeah. Because okay. um, at the moment, AP does not teach these skills in their courses. Okay, another one is, <laughs> would I be correct in guessing that the equipment for this kind of approach is actually cheaper than what people usually use? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So we we specifically use stopwatches, right? Because that is a that is a, a a moment that I want students to understand that they can measure the angle dependence, the second order approximation, with a stopwatch. That is an important thing for me to get across that you have the ability. You don't need to have fancy equipment in a fancy lab to find cool stuff. Um, and so and we've also tried to do equipment that's flexible as opposed to sort of one stop shop. We have I think similar to. Um, what you have in some of your labs, the, the equipment is all sort of in storage around the room, and the students can go and grab what they need when they need it. Um, and we want that sort of flexibility, so we're using force sensors, and we're using stopwatches, and we do have position sensors and a bunch of stuff, but we really want it to be, um, yeah, flexible and combinable and, and that kind of stuff. Okay, and then the other one I was wondering about is, uh, oh, my, my I should add, yeah. um, the, the single um, complaint that we've gotten from students is that the equipment isn't fancy. <laughs> you know, students are all like, yeah, I get what you're doing, this is all great, but like, why are we just using stopwatches? <coughs> well, it's because you're charging them so much money to go to school there. <laughs> yeah, but the labs were useless before anyway. <laughs> it's still better. Yeah. Pedagogically, a lot of gun into this. <laughs> mm. so, so the other thing I was wondering about is, uh, this actually seems a lot more like my undergrad lab experience than typical labs are. Uh, and one thing else that we were expected to do is we were expected to spend three hours a week outside of the lab working on the lab. Uh, are you guys, no? Uh, no, and that's just a, um, a credit hours 
logistical issue that is totally out of my control. Um, so we've got two hours in the lab every week, um, and we do sort of 30-minute pre-lab activities um, just to sort of get them wrapped up. Uh, they're really post-lab, I should say. We call them pre-labs, but they're actually post-lab activities where it's like, we tell you this new analysis tool, now go and practice with a bunch of data and stuff like that. Um, and I should also say explicitly, we do not ask our students to submit lab reports. Apparently people need to hear that sometimes. <laughs> um, so we've been using moving to lab notebooks instead of lab reports. Yeah. Uh, Reference to something you just said, uh, that for example, if you have I don't know, multiple groups, five or four groups, and one of them finishes early, do you let them stay there uh, or keep them until you you bring them at the end, or what happens? Hold on, I have to figure to support my statement. Where is it? <coughs> There's no end. <laughs> to our loop. <laughs> uh, so in this case, right, everything iterates and builds on itself. Once you do one thing, you got to do something else. Um, so there is no done in this lab. There's no done to science, right? You keep investigating, you keep going. Um, yeah. But so for example, that group that ended up with four <laughs> sigma and then they kind of thought it's different, right? It, it's against Sorry? the equation. For example, the group that had like four sigma difference yeah. and did you just keep going? Or? Yeah, because then oh. the question is, you know, with two angles, you can't show that it's, you can't actually make the claim that it's angle dependence. So you now have a hypothesis that you think it's a small angle approximation, so go and test that hypothesis. I see. And the cycle continues. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so this is actually, I think, one of the coolest things about it, and, and one of the things that we're starting to look at is, you know, the collaboration and group work, but also how does this work for different students at different levels, right? The, the idea of the decision making the iteration here is that the students can push it as far as they want, right? So a really, really ambitious group might make it around this loop four or five times in the two hour period. Another group may only get through one in a bit, you know, whatever that may be. They may only get as far as sort of proposing. But everything is, everything sort of counts and so students can really push it as far as they want. Um, but that two hour time, so we actually have data and we've shown that our, all of our students will stay for the full two hours now. Um, in our lab period because you just kind of keep going because there's more questions, there's more science to be done. And, yeah. yeah, let's go here and then here. I'm trying to pull people I haven't heard from yet. So. Yeah, so just wonder about your ass assessment for these labs. So I need to grade, right? Yeah. And then some groups will push more or less, but it doesn't mean that the one they push less is wrong or exactly. it's not doing the job. So how do you deal with that? Exactly. So again, so we grade on the three questions. So the what are you doing, why are you doing it, what will you do next? So what are you doing is just any evidence, any good, clear description of their process throughout the lab. So it doesn't matter what their process was, just that it is appropriately described. Um, why are you doing it is justification that sort of draws on evidence. You know, you actually have a reasonable thing. It's not just because I felt so, it's because, well, you know, we saw this and therefore thought maybe, you know, our uncertainty was this, and so we thought maybe we need more trials to get our uncertainty down, right? So um, having that justification. Um, and then the what, do you, what will you do next is this evidence of iteration. Um, and basically, those three criteria, you know, you, as long as you do it at least once throughout your lab, then that sort of counts. Um, and we don't really grade on correctness, but the TAs will give feedback on correctness, sort of written like, you know, you really should have done 20 trials instead of 10 or whatever. Um, and then we also will have sort of two pieces per lab that are specific to that lab. So as I mentioned, we teach a number of data analysis tools. So one of the points will be whatever new data analysis tool we taught that week will sort of have a specific grading element and whatever other thing. How about the, the quality of justification? Yes, you, you ask them to provide the evidence or justification. Yeah. How about the quality? Will you grade so the work? In that case, it has to be sort of logical and evidence-based. Right. In, ter in terms of, right. so thinking about sort of argumentation, right, yeah. is basically what we're pulling there is, have you actually made a sound argument? Um, and if it's, yeah. Is, it, like, is there a rubric, like a yeah. like claim, evidence, justification, and the components, and also the quality of each part? Um, so we have a rubric, but the rubric is, is just those three pieces. So what are you doing? And level zero is you didn't even give me your method. Level two is you described it in whatever level of detail I want. And you know, one in the middle might be, um, I, I can't remember <laughs> the breakdown is. But we've got three levels, yeah. There was a hand somewhere in the back, yeah. Can we talk about the data? Yeah. So you touched on three things. One was whether it helps. Content knowledge. Content knowledge, which. I think the conclusion was it doesn't. And it doesn't hurt either. It doesn't hurt either. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's just flat, right? Yeah. The other was um, motivation. 
that it makes you think more like a professional experimental scientist. <coughs> yeah. And at least from what you showed, it seemed like that also was kind of a dozen of itself, right? Uh, sure. I mean, you showed two versions of the plot. One had huge error bars. Yeah. So yeah. it's kind of inconclusive. It's inconclusive. Yeah. And then the one from the Colorado group, <coughs> at least when you showed the error bars, it's, it also was inconclusive. It also doesn't hurt. Well, well, doesn't negative mean it hurts? Negative means it hurts. So it either hurt or it was inconclusive. That's yeah. kind of what I, yeah. okay. So then you, you talked about a third thing, yeah. which was basically Actually. how much of an interest the students are taking in being experimentalists, right? Uh, I think you showed a plot. One was where like, uh, um, whether or not they chose voluntarily to go back and iterate on the, uh, on the lab, right? Uh, yeah, at least whether they did. Whether they did, okay, yeah, yeah. maybe they don't actually have an interest in yeah. it. Um, so I'm just trying to gauge uh, if, if we're learning something. <laughs> and actually, I just turn this back to you and say, what are you going to do next? <laughs> but, uh, I mean, can you can yeah. we make these more conclusive? Right? Can you can you reduce the error bars? Do you think you can reduce the error bars enough to make it conclusive? Yeah. So I mean, so the um, the content knowledge, I feel like I'm kind of done. Like I don't I don't yeah. really care if they learn content knowledge anymore. I show that they're not being hurt, and so we'll move on. Right. Um, attitudes is something we'll just keep collecting data to see um, if we can get those error bars down. Mm -hmm. um, so next semester we'll be moving at Cornell, at least we'll be moving into our engineering sequence where we've got 500 students a semester, so data is forthcoming. Um, er small error bars are forthcoming. Um, in terms of the behaviors, I think that's the piece that I'm most excited about, is sort of digging into, you know, I propose these three sort of explanations, agency, authority, and and authenticity, and it's sort of like theoretically that all kind of works and makes sense, but but there are a lot of a lot to do to disentangle that. Um, so the agency in particular will be sort of comparing. So one of the things we're doing is um, collecting a bunch of video of students in the lab to really understand this decision making. Right? Is this their choice? Is it a an expectation that they've just sort of learned that this is the thing that the TAs want me to do now? So I will do it. So by actually sort of listening to their conversations, how do they make the decisions? How, what does this process actually look like? Um, is a big part of it. The pendulum lab, for example, like what causes that conflict and how do we, what do we do about it and those sorts of things. So um, I think the video is gonna be a whole rich world to sort of try to disentangle. Um, but then also starting to test some small manipulations. So the pendulum, I think I mentioned, we're gonna try giving students the assumptions of the model up front to then see how that changes sort of their perspective in the lab. Um, so that'll be next semester. Um, and then other things, yeah, I don't even know. There's just so much richness in there. Uh, we're also looking at things like collaborative group work and gender issues that sort of come up in this decision-making space, which is a whole, whole other ballgame that I haven't talked about. But yeah, I, I have too many ideas, I think, and not <laughs> enough time. I guess um, authenticity actually is the, the piece that I'm most excited about. This idea of, of it's not Googleable, but it's not real research. They're not going to publish on their experiment with their swimming goggles, right? Um, and so what actually matters in that spectrum of authenticity and, and how to disentangle that. Um, there's a little bit of work coming out in biology with the course-based undergraduate research experiences that is starting to speak to this, so we're hoping to kind of dig into that a little bit more. Yeah, let's go here. Um, I, maybe this is out of line, but I think it's, it's a lot to expect um, for uh, a single physics introductory course as a single experience um, to, to expect that to be hugely impactful on, you know, um, on being able uh, on measurable outcomes. I think you need a cumulative effect of a strategy, um, and I think it starts with, you know, one innovator. Uh, and so I think you know that's brave of you to be that person. I think that, you know, maybe if more people have buy-in into this, um, then you get more measurable effects. Um, but <laughs> Uh, uh, certainly, um, there's gonna. I think there's a, this pressure. Well, okay, um, th the course is over. Produce your results. You know, mm -hmm. where are our amazing students? And if you're, it, I think, if so long as you're doing as well as what is currently being done, and it's not damaging, it's sort of like, well, <laughs> you know, show me what you're doing that's better. Absolutely, right. And yeah. and and that's why, right, measuring the content knowledge was sort of my. It was really I collect. I didn't really actually care, but I collected it mostly for my department to just be like, see, we're not hurting, mm -hmm. we're we're not doing any, and and we're also engaging them in all these these other behaviors, right. And so that combination to me is 
is sort of a knock to say their exam scores are the same, you don't have to worry, but I'm gonna start playing with, with getting them really engaged in what does it mean to do, to do science, and at least with the engagement in these different iterative behaviors and stuff, seems like a big win, um, that they're doing cool things, whether, whether or not that has long-term impacts will be sort of an open question, and we'll start tracking things like, do we get more physics majors? Do we get more women in the physics department? You know, like a bunch of, a bunch of other stuff down the line. Um, and we also have a, a senior sort of capstone um, lab course, and I'm gonna start sort of teasing. We've started collecting data there already, and so then we'll compare down the line, have we changed our senior physics majors later on? Thank you. Yeah. So <clears throat> it's, it's my job to basically convince faculty that they should be using more interactive processes and active learning, things like that. And when they see data, it's like, eh, doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> that kind of kills me. And, and, and you know, I, I'm saying let's let the data, data drive what we're doing. Right. Um, and so these are not the only data out right. there. Because um, a major variable is not just the student, but also who's instructing the student. Right. So I'm curious. I just want to put that one back up. It matters. <clears throat> right. <laughs> yes, thank you. So I'm, I'm curious, uh, you know, kind of opening this up to the room as, as mm -hmm. well as to you, is what, what is convincing? What, mm -hmm. what, um, what is it that faculty need to hear? Because here's the thing, kind of jumping off what Jesse said, you know, if we're in a vacuum, we have one professor in one department that's doing these things, that's great. But those Lone Rangers, yeah. aren't going to have a broader impact on STEM and, and, a, and a department in and of itself. So how are we going to communicate between three or five or ten different professors in one department and then how's that going to cross over to other departments where we have a major impact on transformation? I know that's a huge question. That's a but, huge question. <laughs> but, but I, I want to start touching yeah. on that and, and I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts and any other thoughts that are in the room on that. I kind of have so. Sorry, I don't know if you were going to answer, for it. but I'm going to cross I, mean, I, I think, I think um, the idea of the Lone Ranger and not being impactful hmm. kind of irks me because I think that it is a Lone Ranger can be very impactful, and if one, if the, especially if it's introductory, like an introductory class, and you make the difference between somebody saying, "I'm going to stay in STEM," or "I'm going to leave," mm -hmm. or "I'm going to stay in physics," or "I'm going to leave." I mean, I think that I I really personally believe that's huge. So I can measure for you. But that be, but that can be hard to measure after. Oh yeah, hard to, well hard to measure. But I think if you're talking, but from a persistence, and I think about underrepresented students because that's what I know most about. Um, for a pers from a persistent standpoint, I think the approach that is being taken can be huge, and but they I, may buy in and may actually stay. But I, I would also say what you're doing is improving attitudes rather than knowledge. You may not see that until the person's in graduate school. Right. 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 But I think uh, it's gonna. I, th I think it's gonna pay off. Like what yeah. you're doing. And yeah. so I mean, the the Lone Ranger and, and how do you actually make broad change is you know there's I'm sure you know there's tons of people entire PhDs sort of evaluating this question and um, you know the I'm most familiar with Charles Henderson's work. Um, uh, where is he? Western Michigan. Um, and you know they have these very unfortunate studies where they you know ask faculty who have changed you know what made you change and data isn't it unfortunately it's sort of one of those things that if we didn't have data no one would believe us but even though we do have data they still don't believe us um, and so you know their experiences they say things like it was it was hallway or lunchtime conversations and and things like that like those are the pieces that you know unfortunately that's why I start my talk with anecdotes. <laughs> um, because those anecdotes, you know, pull at our heartstrings, right, and, and remind us of our personal experiences, and that that seems to be the piece. The you know the thing that I'm learning, um, labs is an interesting space, because um, at the moment I think, um, at least in many, certainly in physics departments, I don't know if this is the case as much in biology and chemistry, um, but the labs are typically sort of the the instructors are almost not involved with the labs like there's been a lab manual that's been being used for 20 years right. and it just sort of it's a machine and it just goes and they don't have any involvement with it but people are becoming deeply unsatisfied with those labs right everyone is frustrated with cookbook cookie cutter labs like this is a universal no scientist thinks that that is a reasonable representation of experiment and so there's like something that is bubbling under the surface that people are finally like getting fed up with this and getting involved. And so I, I think that there's something special happening right now with labs that, um, yeah, it's, it's exciting. And so people are sort of dra driving, driving it a little bit more. And I think partly, I, I, I don't know, 
maybe they're excited because they don't have to do the work. <laughs> you know, once you have a, a set of lab materials, the TAs will then go and, and make it happen. And so, I don't know, it's, it's an interesting question. But there's, there's something, I think the challenges that we're facing in the labs is gonna be different than the challenges we face in lectures. Sure, sure. And just a point of clarification, Jacqueline, I wasn't saying there's a problem with Lone Rangers. I think oh, Lone Rangers no. are fantastic. No, I, I yeah. <coughs> It's how to expand that. Yeah. Our Lone Rangers from 20 years ago are still the Lone Rangers today, right? <laughs> what tips do you have for us Lone Rangers to find other patriots that are out there and gather and get more? Collaborative technology really help to get these things to catch on. Yeah, you should band together and collaborate. <laughs> <laughs> to develop materials and get things to go on. Um, so at least in physics, I mean, we're making all of our materials publicly available and we're running workshops at the APT meetings and stuff like that to try to help people sort of get involved. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's one piece. Um, I don't, I mean, biology, the course source uh, journal has materials and stuff online. I'm not sure how much of it is lab as opposed to lecture based, but that might be an option. I have no idea what's going on in chemistry right now, if anyone knows. We have several cures running on campus right now, so if you're curious about that, just certainly let me know. Yeah, um, yeah, but I think finding, you know, look at who's in the room right now and <laughs> start <laughs> developing media. people together. Pardon? Social media. Social media. Yeah, yeah, that's good too. I'm losing track of who has spoken. I think. I was just going to say that part of the problem with going from the Lone Ranger to the to more broader except. Uh, Use, use of this is uh, resources. So, you know, putting your labs on, online or making them available to people is very, very helpful. The other thing is, is that when faculty come to teach a course, it's, it's, a, it's a big time commitment to switch from the, you know, the more traditional either lecture lab to the, you know, this non-traditional. So that's, somehow, somehow that has to be taken into account. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's no more work than teaching any new course for the first time, um, which I think is something that we sort of forget, that you know, any time right, you teach you, a new course. Right, right. but if, 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 if one doesn't have to invent things from scratch, right? Yeah. If, if, if you say, you know, here's, here's, here's a set of labs that yeah, seem totally. to work at Cornell University or whatever, yeah. we, could, we could use that. Yeah, which is what we're trying to do, right. at least to make that available. Um, in, in, and then I think our, our decision to use sort of low cost equipment helps that because one yes. of the things I was worried about early on was, but every university has a different you know, set of equipment and things set up um, to run it. And so how are they going to want to use our labs? They're not going to want to buy new material, right, right. Um, to support this. And so we sort of deliberately went with these sort of low cost and flexible equipment that everyone should have around. Um, which a couple institutions are like, but we just bought all this fancy right. equipment. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> To answer this question, with I guess asking you, uh, is there any research or anything work done on evaluations you get, compared to like in your class or different class or traditional classes? Do you get better evaluations or student evaluations? Yeah. Uh, um, I think on purpose I haven't looked at them, okay. <laughs> or I, I haven't studied them. Um, we we've we've been doing focus groups and you know just based on our local context, making sure getting feedback from the students and. All of our evaluations are very positive, other than the very loud complaint that our equipment isn't fancy enough. Um, otherwise, people are, are very excited. And, and I think my, the, just to go back to anecdotes, the um, best piece of feedback that I got was from an upper division student who came to me and said, we heard what you're doing in the labs, and I wish I had had that when I was in first year. I was like, done. <laughs> it's the best I could possibly have hoped for. But um, yeah, in, in general, I think student evaluations are typically very flawed for very many reasons, and so I just, yeah. It's a whole other reason to talk, probably. Yeah. All right, so I mean, go. I just feel like the word, the lab kind of sacrifice widths for depths. Yes. Okay, but there are sentences we have to cover, so you cut something off. Right. So um, I don't know whether, have you, or do you plan to investigate whether students can transfer the knowledge or skill from those labs to the labs untouched? Uh, because, for example, like we want them to produce or develop the skills, yeah. right, of doing expert exploration, and uh, they can develop their own knowledge yeah. from future study. But after they leave your course yeah. or this lab, do they go back to the tradi traditional way, or or are the skills maintained? 
Yeah, so that was the um, sophomore lab. So the second, I went really quickly oh. over that. But we, we did track students into the second year. Um, it was an electronics course, which was relatively structured, but the students had to write um, sort of long lab reports. They worked for two or three weeks on each lab. Um, and in that case, we still saw the, these behaviors carrying over into that course, even though we were not involved in the course at all. Um, so there is some amount of transfer, and we'll, we'll keep looking at that. We want to look at, um, for example, what happens when they get into research groups. Um, you know, and we're still not sure how to actually measure this. Maybe like, I don't think I can really get faculty to, maybe I can get faculty to sort of self-report, are your students more skilled than they used to be? I don't know. Um, but we'll track especially the advanced lab course down the line to see um, how much of it carries on. Um, one of the things that we have heard, so when I was at the University of British Columbia, they were doing a lot of sort of flipped classroom, active learning in the lectures. And uh, once the students sort of moved in upper division courses that went back to the very traditional way, they had an almost revolt from students complaining and they wanted the classes to be active again. They didn't want to go back to traditional. So we'll keep our ears open once our students get into the um, upper division course lab courses to see if the same revolt kind of happens. So why are you making me do this lab? I want to you know, design my own experiment or whatever it might be, but we'll see. Yeah. yeah. Just a uh, question slash comment. So slash your opinion. But, uh, it seems logical, right? You work on these at, uh, at the beginning of these uh, sophomores and there's the freshman students and then because when you get to the senior level classes, I, I'm, I'm assuming that everyone is doing critical. Critical think is a big component in their classes at the senior level. Let's assume that. Okay. Everyone is doing a good job <laughs> over that at the senior level, right? They're about to graduate. They're going to the industry. So critical think. You know. So you're doing I, a service. I agree it's important. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's a service you're doing forward so is that something planned over so do, first of all do you teach the, the senior level classes as well and the second one was this intentionally just to work with your department head or whatever to to do at the beginning and then that would have a long-term impact with these students so, yeah so um so i uh we are currently in the process of thinking looking re-examining our advanced lab course to start to see whether it should get changed um and uh we've been talking about sort of what the students will now be able to do once they get there and we're preparing ourselves to sort of make changes um, to adapt to that um, is all I'm going to say about that. The other piece is that I actually, you know, there is a relatively small fraction of the students in our labs that go on to be physics majors who actually end up in that lab. And so part of the reason that I, I think you mentioned, right, the introductory courses are so pivotal because it's going to dictate whether students per proceed, but also that they're gonna go somewhere else. And so this is the space where I hope that I have taught them skills that will be useful to them, whether they go on in physics or not. Um, and that's sort of our hope. Um, so one of the things that we'll, we've started working with folks in biology um, to just research wise, to, they've been, um, they have a, a rel almost pure like course, um, but students are designing their own experiments and things like that. And we wanna start looking at, do we have students who take our physics course and then theirs and vice versa and are there sort of fun things can we see transfer um, between those two courses but we'll we'll start just trying to track that the the issue becomes you know measuring it when they sort of go out into the world it's really hard to do a controlled study because things become really uncontrolled really fast um, in that space but yeah. yeah yeah so I want to go back to the question you were asking um, I, I think there's a, a several reasons why things are slow to be adopted, and they're not all necessarily bad. Uh, so one of them, which I think is bad, is that if you do things the traditional way and it goes sort of okay, nobody's gonna challenge you on it. Um, and it's a lot more work to do things a new way if you, you're already rolling on a traditional thing. Sure. Uh, but the thing that I think is a more serious concern to think about is that uh, for those of us who aren't paying attention to the education research all the time, it's hard to figure out which things are really robust and which things are new and exciting, but mm -hmm. still need more testing before they're worth implementing on a mass scale. Um, and from that point of view, it maybe is good to have a little bit of conservatism there because we sort of know how well things work now and we know there are problems, but we also know it sort of works. Uh, and if we scrap a bunch of things that work uh, and replace them with something that might be better in the way it was tested, but not better across the boards, we actually could end up creating more problems than we solve. So from that point of view, a little bit more of a gradual implementation uh, may not necessarily be actually a bad thing. Right. Well, thank you. I know I've been gone for a while, I apologize. You, you may have been asked this before, but how does what you're doing differ from Pogol? 
Um, Processory is guided inquiry learning, which is more common to biology and chemistry than physics, I think. I think, no, I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> oh, I don't know, I was just trying to. Um, uh, so uh, typical inquiry labs, as I understand them, and again, you know, one of the things with education is right there are words and we use the words to mean many different things. Right. Um, so most of the times I have seen inquiry, um, it's it's about you know giving students agency, right? You know they kind of design their own experiments or whatever. Um, still for the purposes of learning a particular concept or content. And so the piece, the way in which we are different is that I really don't care what they find in the end. It's not about learning a particular concept. It's about the process of getting there. Yeah. And, and that removing yourself from having to steer the students in a particular direction, right, that, that I think is, is one of the fundamental pieces that becomes different. Yeah, early Pogel was exactly what you said. It was guided toward an outcome. But, but yeah, and Pogel's been around for about 15 years now. And once again, it's more of a chemistry biology thing. Mm -hmm. But now it's really focused on the process, not so much on the outcome. Yeah. So it's, it's very interesting, going back to what Tom was saying, and sort of standing the test of time. It's interesting to see how the various STEM education uh, groups are sort of converging together in their different lab approaches. Yeah, and I, I would also add we've been converging and also going around in a circle. Right. So I found papers from like the early 1900s. I read someone from 1972, I think, that like basically says all of the stuff that I'm saying right now, and it's like we're just like rediscovering it all over again. Um, whatever reason, you know, this idea of it doesn't get traction or it doesn't push forward, whatever that might be, is, is sort of a fascinating question to me, but um, yeah, anyway. But but for me, the, the big piece is that we have really disentangled that I, I am not trying to teach people a particular, I'm not using the experiments to teach content, I'm using the experiments for the sake of experiment. Um, and that seems to be the, the difference. And that's not to say, right, this is this is my approach, this is a, an approach, um, there are many possible pieces um, to sort of play around. Yeah. No, I think, Don, most of it's rooted in constructivism. So, yeah. I mean, Pogel, this approach, discovery-based, inquiry-based, you know, I, I think there's, the bend is significant. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of getting traction for broader change. Um, changing just the lab component is a relatively safe thing to tinker with. As you were saying, in general, more people are unhappy with labs than labs. So that's something that people are willing to change. Also, um, I think there's this idea of coverage and people are unwilling to say, well, I'm, I'm happy to give them lab time, but I still have to cover this stuff. So if people are retaining their lecture portion and just changing the lab portion, that may be a point of consensus that, 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 no, that many people could come to. And then the other thing about um, the, port, the, the purpose of lecture is to both provide coverage and um, distinct processes and correct answers, whereas the purpose of lab is for experimenting. I know one of your particular interests, Ken, is looking at um, non-major courses. You know, we have these service courses, and that's the, the, the hard thing about the lone wolf, is that if you have a great course for non-physics majors, and then you don't see them again because they're non-physics majors, it's hard to tell what impact you've had. But if you can see an impact spread possibly just across the isolated lab components, across courses, across uh, disciplines, that may be a really nice point of comparison and a, a place where people are willing to take a risk of change. So I see great hope in, in that, that lab component. And, you know, I'm really curious about, <coughs> and, and this is, this could open a can of worms and, and uh, it result in a lot of harumps. Um, is there an, Are we saying something by not saying something um, with who is teaching the laboratory? So <clears throat> I think that the students get this concept in their, in their minds, not all, but some, get this thought that, well, it's a graduate student, student teaching the lab. So even the faculty don't consider this important. Right. I'm not saying that that's true. I'm saying that that's a perception. Right, and, and do you know to what degree have you done any sort of perception analysis on that sort of thing? Um, the only related piece that I have is how much the lab is worth 
in yeah, the course that breakdown. Too, that too. Um, so our, you know, we have a four credit course where nominally three credits is the lecture stuff and one credit is the um, lab, but our labs, and Beth and I talked about this earlier today, our labs are not worth 25% of the course, they're worth more like 10. Yeah. Um, and, and that sends a message to students, and I've had students in focus groups explicitly say, I, there's no, it's hard for me, I think the comment, the, the, it was actually this tension between like, they're excited and they want to put effort into the lab, but, but they see those numbers and it's worth it for them to put the time into the other class um, rather than this one, which is, which is a problem. So, um, and that's, that's the graduate, you know, the TA issue aside, I don't even know what that would do. Yeah, because there are, there are fantastic graduate students doing fantastic yeah. work in these classes, and then there are some that they just kind of show up, right? And if that. If that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I mean, one of the things, that, just to battle that piece, right, having the undergraduate TAs in there um, has really helped with our pairing, because the, the undergraduates who sign on to do that job, they want to be there, right? They didn't have to do this. Um, and so at least by pairing the graduate TAs with the undergraduate TAs, we make sure that that motivational piece um, is present in the room. Um, but, but in terms of just the fact that it is students and not faculty in front of them, I have no idea what kind of message that, that sends. Can I ask one more question yeah, about that's a fascinating that? question. So to the faculty in the room that are either coordinators of labs or have the ear of coordinators in the labs, is a specific <coughs> TA training program uh, on pedagogical knowledge or account content knowledge. You know, the department's handle the content knowledge, right? Uh, or are supposed to. Um, but the pedagogical knowledge is not something, you know, most faculty come in as faculty not having had any training in teaching, yeah. right? And so we, why would we expect any different or our graduate students? <laughs> so is, is, is there, is there something you would want? Uh, you know, we have an NTLPC, we have programs that are, that are uh, for developing graduate students and faculty for that matter. But within STEM though, is there something that you could see that within your department or if it would span multiple departments that would be helpful to help train your graduate students? Would you allow your graduate student to go to a training and, instead of generating data in your lab? We have it mandatory and Beth does it in our department. Okay. Keith does it. Oh, you're, Keith's doing it now? Sorry. No, yeah. Keith is the lab coordinator. Yeah, no. Oh, we, we got rid of that. Did we get rid of that course? The, one, course. the, the pedagogy course? The pedagogy course. course. Oh, I do teach a pedagogy yeah. course, but I don't think that's sufficient. I think you need it okay. weekly. Okay. That's why I'm saying that. Yeah. I think that that whole course was never my idea. I do, yeah. I do yeah. teach it, but I think that you can't do it in a semester. You need it weekly. You need it in what Keith is doing. Okay. And that's where you need to have the group. Yeah. We tried it in biology, and, and so many faculty said, no, I, I need them generating data, not learning how to teach, literally. So other. I think you, you might be able to pull the safety part in biology and chemistry, right? But like, they might hurt someone, so I need them here to go over the, the safety procedures. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice. The physics, we have a harder time doing. Right. The, so, based, just based on my experience in chemistry, it only, the, the only purpose of the TA meeting with the instructor of record, assuming that they have one for the more introductory courses, is this is how this lab is supposed to work. Here are suggestions to make it work better and faster. These are the safety issues that come up. Thanks, have a great day. Right. That's the entirety of the TA meeting. Um, there's not really a lot of focus on pedagogy at all. Do you, ever, do you ever get pushback from the, so you said your labs spread out over multiple weeks. And there, there's a lot of research that, that's been done over the past several decades that says that, you know, less is more. If you teach them how to learn, they'll learn. It's mm -hmm. not necessarily you've got to cram everything together. Do you get any pushback from your colleagues about teaching less in the labs? No, and and it, it worries me because I and I like literally have to keep showing up to faculty meetings just to be like, really, you're all okay with this? Like, here's here's my evidence, here's my data, it's fine, but like you're all okay, and they they are are wonderfully enthusiastic. So I, I may just be very lucky, or I may have a storm coming for me, you know, tenure time or something. But <laughs> so far, so far, so good. And again, it, it it goes back to I think there's something different about the labs. I think they are deeply unsatisfied, and so anything is better at this point. I have a comment about educating the TAs or like lab instructors. So uh, beginning of this year, I found myself as a lecturer and a lab coordinator of a lab class in mechanical engineering as a graduate student. And uh, so 
I've been doing that class for like two years. I've been coming TL to TLPDC workshop back and forth, and like I have some idea about how to do it, but my uh, my colleagues they don't have any idea, and it was one of them the uh, first ever teaching uh, experience, like teaching assignment. So I had to do a lot of meetings with them. I showed them how I conduct my lectures because I didn't want like any difference between my labs and their labs. And I only heard a one comment from one student that that specific instructor is so bad and he's not helpful. And he asked me, like, hey, uh, can I uh, change to your lab? I was like, no, uh, you cannot do that. But the perception of that lab in my department is anyone can teach that. You don't have to have any kind of experience. You don't have to know how you teach. Just go there, sit there two hours, sign their sheets, and that's it. So mechanical engineer would benefit that a lot. And is that because they have a fairly established lab manual they're using? No. So, oh, really? OK. No. So they have no, uh, inexperienced TAs and? Uh, is it because they don't care that much? I don't want to say that <laughs> but it's a one hour credit lab and I feel like it is like the content is really well structured but not the entirety of the class. The content is fair, it's easy to teach. If some if one is like uh, you know, used to programming and that kind of stuff. But other than that, you know, I had to do a lot of changes because we received a lot of really bad feedback from students. They were like, what is this? Why are you using uh, like board markers? Why don't you show us like codes? Why don't you let us use like, computers and all that stuff? And I heard about that for three years and I made changes. But um, so before me, there was another graduate student and uh, he was trying to graduate that semester and he didn't care about the class and he didn't make any changes. But in overall, the uh, discussion part is not evaluated, the labs are evaluated, and even if you do a fantastic job in the lab, like one of my evaluations is around like 3.7, and all the comments about the class, it's about the lecture, because I was a TA, so um, yeah, like, and that's not, that's not, like, up. it's not right, in my opinion. And they asked my opinion about who can teach this class. I was like, yeah, someone with like someone knows programming and taught before. And I found myself with no one like that. Yeah, so in terms of TA training, actually, uh, for Stanford at least, so when we got our PhD, there is a requirement to go to a TA training course. It's only one credit hour. But then that's required when you are a TA for the first time, and you do it in collaboration between the department and cent uh, Center for Teaching and Learning. So make it more like a room. Where, where is this? Stanford. Stanford, okay. Yeah. Great. So essentially, it's kind of somewhat almost like an introductory part, but for teaching. Mm -hmm. And you somehow have that ingredient in you, and then that kind of propagate through okay. later, too. So you can get more if you want to. I want to go back to a point you made earlier about how enthusiastic the undergraduates were after mm -hmm. they sort of got into this. Do you have a like a feedback mechanism where now you've got them excited, you've done sort of a metacognitive analysis of all of this on top of what they're doing, and then maybe they're excited to teach the next year or things like that? Because that's one of the things that I, I uh, did a study uh, a couple of years ago on the effect of UTAs, undergraduate compared to regular TAs. And they were much more significant. They speak the language. It's peer instruction. It's a lot of, a lot of things. But uh, are you doing stuff like that as well? <laughs> not yet. Okay. <laughs> we have the opportunity to, do, but not the time at this point. Because if you've but, got excited yeah. students, why not use them? You know? Yeah. Yeah. So we we have the undergraduate TAs in the labs now. Um, so we have made that a, a common of yeah across the board for all the reasons that you say right yeah. that they are just they're wonderful to have um, in that space. We haven't actually studied whether it's effective. It's sort of one thing. Yeah. <laughs> the undergraduates are self-selecting. Yeah. The, the t graduate TAs are assigned. Yeah. Well, I actually selected the undergraduates in my study. They weren't self-selecting. So. And uh, by doing some kind of cognitive work with them, and teaching them how to 
you know, think about teaching and actually really, really improve their. But they were they selected for the pool to be selected, right? I mean, or did you just reach out to I, I Joe's student and said, well, hey. I pulled them out of my class. Your honors class, yeah, but but still a little bit different than the graduate TA situation right. where everyone oh, yeah, yeah. is, is assigned, right. right? And they could have said no, also. they could have said and no, then, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. which is a big difference, yeah, yeah. But it's a, it's a, I mean, so I mean, there's in um, you know, there's lots of research that's sort of looking into all of the benefits of these undergraduate TA and LA um, right. learning assistant programs and stuff. And right. um, at this point, it's it hasn't been where my expertise has been, so I'm I'm taking you know, your research and other people's research and, and doing the implementations, but not studying it specifically. But it would be interesting, and you know, one of one of the questions that I'm really curious about, and I think the numbers are too small to ever actually do it, but this question at the very beginning, these students want to be theorists instead of experimentalists. I wonder if I can get more experimental physicists by the end of this, um, but we'll see, you know, either through the, the TAs or those students, but yeah, we'll see. Yeah, Tom. So, if, if you're saying, that there's kind of two things you're saying that they go together towards something that, uh, we talked about a little bit and had resistance about. But if you're saying that the students are complaining that they're putting in a quarter of the hours for the lab and not getting a quarter of their grade for it, and that they're not actually learning content in the lab, should we be running the labs as separate courses? And have the, them <laughs> graded completely separately as a one credit course? We keep it in account. And, yeah. Yeah. And, and then if they had scheduling issues, they could come back and take the lab a different semester also. I don't see why not. I think is the right answer to that. <laughs> um, especially for things like, I think. Keith and I want to do this. Oh, you Sorry. want to do yeah. this now? Good. Yeah. Okay. And I think we'll we mentioned talk. AP credit, right? That students yeah. could AP out of the lecture, but not the lab. You know, you can do things like that. I think the risk becomes that, um, you know, because the intro courses are service to other departments, right? That they will no longer require the lab and students will only have to take credit hours so through the lecture part yeah. and so by Not the here, end of it. it's a university core that they have to have lab science. Yeah, oh, there you go. Um, I think the bigger risk here is uh, you could end up having some lags where students just needed a lab course to graduate and weren't able to get into it. But in this case, right, I think the benefit is because the content is so disentangled and if you really have open-ended questions where it doesn't matter what you're coming in with, right, then that should be fine. I'm gonna go back to everything I know about physics I learned from the Big Bang Theory, right? Wait, the TV show? Yeah. Oh, God. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm teasing, but I'm getting back to the point about why, you know, they hate lab and they want to be a theoretician. Theorist. Oh, I could, I could, I think this needs to eventually be, I need to pull together like, that, the, everything I hate about um, popular culture about physics, right? Like everything from, and my biggest one, my biggest pet peeve is actually the LIGO um, hmm. result, right? What was the big headline after LIGO? discovered gravitational waves. Confirmed Einstein. Confirmed Einstein, right? Not that we did this crazy thing and measured two black holes merging in outer space. Like, that's nuts. It was that we confirmed Einstein, really. Right. So, so theoretical physics is sexier than yeah. experimental? That's which, which, good for them, right? Like, that's not easy to do. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but that's, I mean, that's one of my, and I'm, I'm, I'm a physics education researcher. I'm not an experimentalist by any means, but I just think it's, Experiment is so cool. Like, why wouldn't you be excited about that? So, <coughs> <coughs> on that note, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, um, I can plug into this. I was a grad student at Cornell. In theory, I was a theorist <laughs> at, at Cornell, but. At Cornell, there are no, or at least when I was there, there are no required courses except for advanced lab for graduate students. There, that is the only one required course. I also will have to say. I made an A plus in advanced lab, yeah. and that was unheard of. Most people made they made A's or B's or C's, right? And they tried to make me an experimentalist, <laughs> but it didn't work. But anyway, we we need to end. It's three o'clock, and I actually have to be. Uh, I have to talk to some students across here. You can stay and talk to people. I think we have to give her a break. She's been talking for two hours.